<laughs> it's recording. Okay. So, um, I've been trying to think up what I was going to say for this presentation. I, I, I think I thought about all the things I've been hearing lately about um, with development and job development in general. You know, it seems like all of the interest today is on like JavaScript or on Dart or on TypeScript or some of these other um, new fads that are popping up. And um, I wanted to try to think about what could we do to sort of make what interesting again for the, the new crowd. So to you guys, it's preaching to the choir. You guys are already there, but how can we get more people interested? But before I did, uh, I did it, I wanted to go back and look at 2013. We made a lot of promises last year at Google I.O. about what we wanted to do. Um, and I wanted to kind of grade our progress and see what we did since then. So um, one of the things we said we would do um, with the new steering committee format is we would um, try to adhere to more openness and simplicity. And um, so um, there's a couple of things we did get done. We now allow external people to commit uh, to get a plus two. Uh, we do kind of have a continuous integration server now, although it doesn't do like full builds and tests. Uh, and push out night does it push out nightly now? So it does that. It's like all it's about 90% where I think it should be. Um, we uh, did not do full mavenization, um, I think for good reasons, because kind of we've sort of uh, been discussing whether or not we really should do mavenization, or maybe we should do gradleization or buckeyeization or one of the other build systems. We kind of really haven't uh, settled on a build system yet. Um, regular public steering committee meetings, I think we're doing better recently than we did before, but not as good as maybe some people would like. Um, on simplicity, that was another thing we promised. Um, uh, we were going to disentangle the dependencies to make it more modular. So if you didn't want to depend on quit user and get everything, you could just get a small piece of it. And um, I know uh, Thomas Breuer worked on some of that, and Doc Doc recently um, did some work on that. So that's in progress. It's not done yet, but it's it's making progress. Um, getting rid of quit.xml files or reducing the reliance on them in favor of something else like annotations or something. Um, we haven't made any progress on that yet. Um, and delete deprecated code. We have deleted some things. Uh, did we delete event uh, listeners yet? No. But we have deleted So I think we deleted IE6, didn't we, Daniel? Victory. <laughs> okay. Speed. Actually, the story here is really good. And so, um, first of all, we wanted to increase the compile speed by 50%. Um, so for optimized mode, we're, we're not even started on that yet, but for draft compile, uh, we've made significant headway. Um, John Stalkup and Roberto have been working nonstop for like the last six months or more on incremental compilation, and I've seen it in action uh, on even on large projects, and it's, um, it's pretty fast. And so that's going to be a pretty good story soon for at least super dev mode. Um, We've continued to improve the code size. Uh, not, not, nothing like dramatic or major, um, but there have been some, some improvements. For example, I think Roberto made a change to the code splitter that reduced the size of one of the fragments by like 10%. Yeah. So that was pretty good. Um, tune for um, modern JSVMs, which was something we were talking about for a while. Daniel spent a lot of time. He sits next to the V18 uh, in Munich, and um, he got all the little tips and tricks from them, and he, he made he even made a one-line change to Gwit recently that um, sped our benchmarks up by two to three hundred percent, if you can believe it, one line. <laughs> um, so better profiling uh, and reporting. Um, well, um, Brian's did some changes to the source maps recently that have kind of improved their accuracy and not led to, to a false sense of that you can put breakpoints everywhere. Uh, he's also re reduced the size, and Doctog's been improving the stack trace um, capability quite recently, and there's been some minor improvements in that. Um, but I, I think we need uh, a lot more work. For example, uh, Emma is basically going away, and I, I believe it doesn't even work with Java 7 or Java 8. Now. It's, it's basically completely broken for us internally. People are asking for code coverage. So we need to come up with um, ways to replace some of the things by dev mode are going away. Interop. Uh, we said we wanted to make it very easy to interrupt with external JavaScript libraries and work on that's been progressing uh, pretty well. I'd say probably about 70% done on the new JavaScript interrupt system. Um, 
we were going to improve the integration of the Closure Compiler a lot. We haven't gotten to that yet, but some of the ideas there were, uh, you know, being able to, um, uh, you know, load in JavaScript libraries with the GWT code and have them optimized together and minified together so that you wouldn't have to, you know, load in a non-minified external JS uh, just so that the, the identifiers are, are publicly named so you can call into them. Um, Supporting hybrid apps. These are apps where you know part of your app is written in GWT, part of it's maybe written in JavaScript, or part of it's written in like Objective C, or part of it's written in uh, native Java, like on a Dalvik on Android. Um, we've actually done a lot of work internally, uh, but nothing uh, externally good proper yet. But there's several uh, products that we're building on this. Um, you might have saw Google Sheets. That's something I announced that would create. The new Google Spreadsheets is partially built in GWT and partially built in native Objective-C code, and they call into one another um, uh, on, the, on iOS. And on, um, on the web, it just all compiles down to JavaScript. Uh, and on Android, it all runs to Java. So we kind of get three platforms for one code base. Um, so Java 7 and Java 8 support. We started that last year. Uh, Roberto, I think you finished Java 7. 100%. So all the like Java 7 language features are done. Java 8 language syntax. I did a prototype uh, God, last November, I think it was. I think James Nelson took it and ran off with it. <laughs> um, but it basically was, as far as I remember, it was basically pretty complete. Like it implemented lambdas, it implemented reference expressions, and all the new stuff in Java 8. The stuff that's missing is all of the JRE emulation classes, and I'll get to that later about like what we really need to do to accomplish that. So reliability. Um, one of the things we promised was close 100 of our top uh, bugs. I didn't have time to research whether or not we did this. I know uh, Daniel took like a sledgehammer to the bug tracker, so I, that doesn't necessarily count as closing the top 100 <laughs> bugs. I, I would count fixing the top 100 bugs as maybe uh, uh, do, you, do, you, do you have any stats? Do you know anything about um, how many of the really egregious ones? That so there's one really top priority thing um, that was requested a lot, that was CSS3 support um, in GWT. And that yes. was actually, if you combine all of the different requests, that is actually at the top, not the time one. And okay. actually, Julian took this up really well. And we now have a working version of GSS uh, resource. And this means we can just get this into 2.7 and have a decent CSS3 support. Okay. Not decent, a really great one. So at least one has a top bug to be placed. We proved the fixed time bugs. Huh? We proved the fixed time bugs on the top bugs. OK. Well, that's, that's, that's progress. Um, improve the speed and reliability of unit testing. Uh, I think Brian's probably a better judge of whether we did anything yeah, on that. Um, yeah, I, I think there, there's, um, I think the biggest, the big thing right now is, is the transition from uh, dev mode based uh, tests to web mode tests, and uh, there's been some progress. Uh, <coughs> there's done some progress on, on uh, making uh, the test framework uh, more reliable. In this case, like we have, we didn't get the web framework uh, exercise on much before, and I think it's in a better state now. Um, going beyond that, I have like a prototype that's oriented more towards internal Google or better integration with the WebDriver, and I'm going to see where I can go with that. Um, OK. I have a slide later that you might want to talk to. It's about like maybe yeah. where we should go in the future. Uh, so there's been some, some minor improvements to that, but uh, we probably need to have far to go. Last year, we had a lot of improvements. Um, deprecate older browsers. That was another thing we promised to do uh, last year. Some people actually don't like this particular thing that we promised, but I think we did manage to get rid of IE6 and 7, right? It's, it's, completely, it's completely gone now, right? Like, yeah, like the exorcist. It's so some of the stuff is already gone from Trunk. Yeah. Uh, 2.6.1 was the last release that's going to support IE6. You have to manually switch it back on. And so no, Trunk right now would be broken with IE6, yes. Okay. But there's still some code that needs to be deleted. IE8, there's still a looming debate. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The, Embeddability, uh, there was talk about maybe breaking up the GWT SDK into smaller pieces so that you know you can hook it into other tools more easily. Right now, it's just like this monolithic GWT dev jar that's both the compiler and dev mode and the test harness and the Jetty server has a whole bunch of stuff in it. And we were thinking about um, making it into a bunch of smaller utilities so that you could launch them individually if you you know 
bring wood into your IDE. You don't have like 10 gazillion classes completing against things that you don't need. Um, I think there's been some progress. I mean, at least the code server for super dev mode is a separate jar now. Uh, so that's a progress. We probably want to move dev mode out of there eventually as well. Um, and insert more hook points for integration with external tools. That was something that Red Hat had asked for, um, for Arai, because uh, they're kind of like cloning or forking several parts of the GWT compiler to do their stuff. I think some people have also done some things with GWT, the GWT.create call. Um, I don't know if An Andre is here. Um, Andre. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Uh, yeah, and so I think he's like, are, are you patching GWT to hook in your stuff? It's a patch to GWT itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe we should have a generic like plug-in system for the compiler where you can patch in passes to the compiler like before and after AST construction, things like that. But it's not started. Mobile, um, so we haven't done anything specific in GWT proper because we already kind of had a good story. You know, last year we hired Daniel because we looked at MQWIT and we were like, wow, this is already exactly what we need. And um, uh, MQWIT is a pretty good library. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some performance uh, things about it that I like later on. But um, we've done nothing really on application lifecycle and offline um, support. Uh, some of that is because some of the things we originally wanted to, to use, like the uh, app, app cache, are kind of going away and be replaced with this new thing called Service Worker. And so this, the, the underlying specs to even support this are changing and being upgraded as we speak. So um, it's probably good that we didn't start on it yet. Um, packaged apps, is, we have with phone gap for that. Um, and that works pretty well. Um, what we haven't done is we haven't really figured out exactly what our widgets 2.0 story is. We kind of hinted in with uh, Create that we wanted to bias it towards web components, uh, the web component spec, but we really haven't really specced out exactly what that means yet. And I think part of that is going to depend on the new JavaScript interrupt system and the Java 8 support. And like when that stuff is fully landed and we start actually trying to develop some apps with it, we'll get a good idea of what the web, the new you know widget 2.0 should look like. Um, I'm essentially probably going to be interested in that because you guys have a lot of widgets. Okay, so the overall story is we've made some decent progress, I think, from last year. But um, as you saw, we didn't get a lot of, there's a lot of stuff we didn't get done. And, and for some of the things coming up, like JRE8 emulation, we're going to need a lot of help from the community, from you guys. And so now I'm going to preach to the choir and give you and everyone who's ever going to watch this recorded video the recruitment pitch of why you should get involved. Well, the first thing that um, we should think about with Quid is that it's really old. It's, you know, from 2006 and in internet years or web years, that's a really long time. You know, complete platforms have arisen and died in that time. The fact that it's lasted um, eight years is, you know, pretty good testament to it. Um, but for a lot of people, they always like to go and look at the new shiny thing that's out there. You know, every month, couple of months, or every couple of quarters, or every couple of years, something new comes on the block, and everyone wants to rush to it. Probably everyone now wants to write their app in Swift. You know, <laughs> um, and so we need to put a fresh coat of paint on Wit. Java's had a fresh coat of paint on it with Java 8. You know, uh, Objective C got Swift to put on top of it. C++ has even got a fresh coat of paint now, like C++ 11 or OX or whatever it is. Um, so uh, JavaScript's got, got ECMAScript 6 coming up, so it's time to put a new coat of paint on it. Because um, if we don't, some people are basically going to look at Quit and say it's the modern COBOL, basically. You know, it's for these legacy apps. They're going to be running banks, and uh, they're just going to sit in the corner running on some old server for like 10 years, don't touch them, but you know, no one needs to write any new code except for like 50, 60-year-old you know, people who haven't retired yet. <laughs> That's a good one. You know, <laughs> where's the excitement right, in good development? That's the question. A lot of people come up to me sometimes, they go, Hey, bra, isn't isn't Gwit dead? I mean, I hear that a lot, even internally. Sometimes people come up and say, "I heard it was dead." Well, the question is, it? Well, right now it's used by about three thousand plus Googlers. We can measure who's committing and who's doing what, including 
things like, you know, of course, AdWords, spreadsheets, group shopping, express lights, hotels. I even learned recently that the Android Play Store developer portal is done with Gwit. I didn't even know that. I just broke them by accident and then <laughs> found out that they were in Gwit. You know, offers, you know, lots of stuff is using Gwit. And externally, as we measure things, there's at least 100,000 external developers. Um, most of them are probably an enterprise, you know, they're not very visible on the internet at large, um, but they're out there. And if I grep the entire web, going into Google's index, looking for nocache.js, I find that there's 20,000 unique domains using Gwit. That's 20,000 different companies. Um, if I actually look at URLs, unique URLs that contain nocache.js is something like a billion. Um, but that's, of course, there are like portal sites, you know, like there's ones in Japan and China that are using Gwit, and so like they've got like 100,000 pages on them, and they all have the same script, so you can't really count that. I think unique domains is a better measurement. Large organizations use it, as we know. Apple, I found that, uses it. Their IADS uh, workspace. Uh, Amazon Web Console. Nike at the last Gwit.cray came up to me and told me about all the Gwit apps they were using inside. Uh, a lot of, Daniel can tell you all the banks all the healthcare places, probably pretty much all of Germany uses it. Uh, there's a lot of users. And even the National Security Administration, through a job posting I saw, they were using GXT and GWT. So they're using Sencha and GXT for prison. found Lily's group. Also. Huh? Lily's group. The one beyond Pfizer. Behind Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> so... Another thing people will say is Gwit is slow, and in some respects it is. Like the compilation or refresh story has always been slow. We know that. But in terms of uh, the actual application that's delivered to the end users, question is, is it slow? And I'm I'm here to tell you actually, as far as we can tell from the latest measurements, it's not slow. It's fact, it, as fast or faster than all the other frameworks. For example, here's a recent Box 2D benchmark on V8 comparing against C. JVM, Flash, not all of them are up there. Um, ASM.js, Dart VM, Dart to JS. And as you can see, we're basically uh, about half the speed of the JVM. And we're, I think we're a little bit slower than ASM.js, which is C code compiled to, you know, pretty much brain damaged JS. But um, <laughs> it speed-wise, it's a pretty good story. And a lot of it's thanks to Daniel. He, he tripled our speed recently. Um, our story actually on the other browsers is also good. For example, on the latest Safari, which has this new VM called the FTL JIT, uh, we just blow everybody away. Like like some of the other benchmarks uh, don't even complete. They get slow script warnings and die. So um, our speed story there is good. On Octane, it's kind of a mixed story. Like, for example, against JavaScript, handwritten JavaScript, on some of the benchmarks were faster and others were slower. For example, on this Ray Trace benchmark, uh, we destroy JS. Um, but for like things like Delta Blue and um, what's the other one? Another one. Um, Splay. Splay. You know, there's some others where we got to figure out what's going on. But it might be speed that those are just running as fast so, as um, they can. I don't know on which top you actually ran these, but I still have outstanding patches for these to fix these. Ah, okay. So, so um, I basically all of, so I did a, couple, a little bit of work in porting. So I sit with the V8 team, and they use the the, uh, the Octane V8 benchmarks to measure their speed. It's just one of their testing stuff. So I figured it might be a good idea to just port them to Java and compile them back and see how we do. And we should be at least as fast as handwritten JavaScript. And um, people would say, well, it's Java code. It's ought to be running actually a little slower because there might be some overhead. But if you look at it, there's actually no overhead because V8 is looking for this well-structured code, and that's exactly what classes are. And as it turns out, if you fix everything in Gwit that's basically standing in that way, you can actually run faster. And so some of these, we already fixed these, and some of them, we're just bound to fix them, and we'll just increase runtime performance. I look forward to rerunning those soon. I think Navier Stokes is broken, by the way. Yeah. So, so Devil's Advocate, how much of this is making tweaks to the benchmarks? Yeah, it's it's benchmark. general okay. improvements to the web compiler. It's not something yeah. you just do for the benchmark. Okay. So uh, for example, the Box2D benchmark, I downloaded the Java jar for the thing, made zero changes, basically just, uh, comp I actually, well, okay, I made one change. It was using like Java Lang thread and some other things. I had to like super source them in to make it compile, but that's basically out of the box performance, no tweaks. Um, okay. So, 
Another thing people will say is, you know, I've compiled a GWT application. It's like a megabyte or four megabytes of JavaScript. You know, GWT just produces really bloated code. Uh, and that's, that can be true if you're not, like, careful what you're doing. You're pulling in just horrendous amount of dependencies and going crazy. Um, but uh, here's a comparison of Box2D benchmark. I just pulled this Java jar, 2D uh, Box2D jar off the web, stuffed it, stuffed it into an entry point, ran the benchmark, and we are actually the smallest. We're smaller than C, which, and that's a stripped executable. We're smaller than handwritten JavaScript that's been minified. We're smaller than the Flash uh, AS3 that's been compiled to SWF. We're smaller than Dart ideas. We're, in fact, the smallest. So actually, all the things I could measure, and there's actually more than this. There's, like, Go versions and other things. I, we are the smallest. And so um, if you know what you're doing and you, you're careful, you know, good code can be very small. And this is not even getting out, getting rid of things like array lists. Like if we dropped in elemental collections and things like that into I patch box city, I probably could get that down to like 40k. So the fundamentals I think that we have already are strong. We have good performance. Actually, I'd say great performance. We have good code size. Um, we have some. Um, uh, you know, we have a really strong li uh, um, ecosystem of libraries, but there's some stuff missing. And this is basically what we need to work on. First thing, it was everybody knows this one is waiting for builds. <laughs> your your day is wasted. I mean, every time you make a change, you're you're waiting multiple minutes for a, a new build. If you're on dev mode, you know, maybe you're waiting five seconds, ten seconds, twenty seconds, thirty seconds, but that's going away. And so now you have to go to super dev mode. Super dev mode actually, if your app is reasonably like medium sized. You know, it's not too bad, but when you start getting up into, you know, things that produce a megabyte, two megabytes, three, megabytes, three megabytes of JavaScript, you're going to be waiting. And the new incremental compile stuff is going to fix some of that, but this is definitely our pain point. This is where we have to put a lot of resources. Debugging is another thing we know is bad. It used to be really good, or at least mostly good with dev mode, but of course the browser gods have taken away our APIs, and so, <laughs> you know, um, and it's not so bad that they did it because with the world moving towards mobile, uh, we would have been in that situation anyway. I mean, the chances of Apple allowing us to put a dev mode plugin into Safari is, you know, zero. So we would have faced that situation anyway. Um, so what do we do about that? That's another problem. Um, testing, I think, in GWT still seems too hard. It's, it's, there's two problems with it, I think. One is, is that um, it's kind of brittle, and so it's not as... It's not as um, stable or consistent, I think, as it should be. Um, and secondly, um, just like setting it, setting it up and launching them is just like a pain. You know, with with dev mode, uh, with dev mode integration in in the um, in your IDE, it probably wasn't so painful. Although if you had to debug a web mode test, it, it was painful. But um, with the in the new reality of not having dev mode, uh, testing is really hard. We need to work on making that a lot better, because otherwise no one's going to run any tests. They're just going to say, screw it. Uh, interoperability. So, I mean, another problem is, you know, the rest of the world outside of the GWT SDK, which is released every six months or a year, or however long it takes, uh, evolve, keeps evolving much faster, you know. So people will come to us and say, hey, how come I can't access the webcam API? Or there's this new index database thing. How come it's not in GWT? Or, you know, WebGL. Why is there no WebGL in GWT? So, um, we can't release, uh, you know, with SDKs fast enough to keep up with both the evolution of the browser, which every six weeks Chrome pushes out a new version, or the evolution of the JavaScript ecosystem. If people want to use Angular, people want to use D3.js or some you know, some other library, and so um, to do that, it basically, is a real pain in the butt today. You have to basically write Disney methods and wrap everything, and boilerplate syntax, right? This is another big complaint. If you talk to any JavaScript programmer or other Java hater, they're going to tell you, you know, how much boilerplate or how verbose Java code is. Uh, and so um, what can we do about that? We we'll make you guys do this or other good <laughs> developers at the end of the day. That's what we want to get to. So we have some solutions for some of these things. Java 8 Lambdas, they're awesome. We need to get them ASAP. Deploying them in, within your organizations or even at Google is going to be a longer-term process because, you know, 
people uh, migrate slowly. But I mean, we can run Java 8 code in the browser, probably. It would be longer for the server to catch up to run Java 8, but you know, if you were willing to do so, when we, put, when we release Java 8 supporting WIT, you could actually run a split application where the client side code is using like lambdas all over the place for event listeners, but the server side code is still stuck with, you know, Java 7 syntax or Java 6. Or depending on your organization, some people are stuck on Java 5. Um, <laughs> and so, but uh, I, I believe the win on this is so large that people will literally go, you know, uh, strangle their boss to get, let them use Java 8 lambdas. <laughs> okay, Terrace Disney syntax, right? You just want to access foo.x, right? Why do I have to say public native void, blah, 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 slash asterisk, dash minus? It's such a pain in the butt. Um, well, with the new um, interop system, basically there's this magic method called JS. And it seems like it's a JavaScript eval statement. You just put some JavaScript string in there. But it's actually a compile time parse of that JavaScript. And so it gets optimized uh, and shoved into the output uh, at compile time. And it can take parameters. So for example, um, it's a var args method. So for example, here's a, here's a method that takes a one parameter and adds it to another. And it takes two arguments. And it just will add those two strings together. And um, so it's, it's an interesting implementation about why that, how this magic method works, because it even works for primitives. And, um, you don't have, it doesn't have to box or, uh, or unbox them uh, at runtime. Um, so, go to the next one. Um, another thing that we are missing in Java that we have in JavaScript and other languages is first class uh, array literals. And so, you know, if you just want to declare a JavaScript array of strings or of numbers, it's, it's pretty hard to do. Um, you know, you'd have to like create a, today you have to create like a JS array number and add, push a bunch of numbers into it, or you have to write a Disney method to do it. Um, but there will be these helper methods, which are similar magic methods to the one you just saw, uh, like like array or like strings or like ints. They're just type check, type check versions of this one. This is the real magic one. Um, that basically, essentially inserts one of these directly into your code. Also, terse map literals. Um, you know, writing a JSON object in Java is pretty painful. Um, this is basically a magic method. Uh, it has to have an even number of parameters. It's a var arg method, but basically it's key value, key value, key value. And uh, it evaluates to pretty much what you would think it would at compile time. It just slaps in a JSON literal. Um, the other thing you want to do is you want efficient iteration. So if you have one of these things, like a, J, like a, JS, a JS, uh, JS array, you want to iterate over it really easily. And so one of the things you want to do is you want to be able to leverage the JavaScript, uh, sorry, the Java um, iterable uh, syntax, where you can, you can extend iterable T and basically you can do a for loop on it. The problem is, is that this thing um, is essentially a native JavaScript object underneath of it. It doesn't have an iterate method on it to get an iterator. And we don't, in fact, we don't want a Java iterator there because it's it's just inefficient. We actually want it to generate a for loop. And with the new modifications I made in the compiler, um, it actually treats the iterate method on native uh, JavaScript objects as magic and turns it into a, an actual integer for loop. So you don't even get extra boilerplate generating your JS with an iterator that has next and next and things like that. So, how about calling external libraries? Today, um, the way you do it is, you know, you write a bunch of JSON methods with um, JSO wrappers around things, um, and it's a lot of work. With the new Java, Java interop system, which I don't know if you guys have seen this before, it's as easy as just declaring an interface with the method signatures that approximate the method signatures on the external JavaScript library, and then putting at JS type annotation on it. That's all you need to do. And from that point forward, the compiler can just call directly into that API. So for example, in this example, I've just made an interface called jQuery. I put three methods on it, CSS, attribute, and click, and they re return jQuery, because I know that's what the jQuery API does. And so I use that new magic method, and I run dollar sign ul greater li, and I assign it to this interface. 
And now I can just say, just like I would in JavaScript, you know, .css, .export, slow interface, .click, and I pass in a lambda. And that's it. You're now calling into jQuery. You did no work with Disney methods or anything. Sorry, Ray, what was the new magic method doing, the JS thing? That's the one I talked about earlier, Java, the JS method. Yeah. It's on JS.js. We might change the name of it later. Okay. Uh, you know, Dr. might argue, but... Uh, it's changed name several times before, but basically it's a compiled, it's like the quit.create method. You, pa you can only pass a literal string into it, mm -hmm. um, and what it does is it parses this as JavaScript and then search a, search a raw JavaScript AST node for you. Okay. Uh, it literally actually declares a, 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 a Disney method and makes that the body of it, and, and then, then replaces the, this with a call to the Disney method. So it just saves you the trouble. It's syntactic sugar, essentially. The JS type uh, interface, though, is a two-way street. So not only does it allow you to call out to JavaScript, but it allows JavaScript to call into Quit code. And so here I've declared an interface called foo, and I've declared a simple method on it called my method. Now, ordinarily, that would allow me to call any JavaScript object that had a my method, dot my method on its prototype. But if I actually implement this interface in Java, and I have a method called my method here that's overriding that, and now I pass into JavaScript my Java object here. Well, here when it calls this, this, this uh, takes this Java object in JavaScript, when it calls my method, actually it's invoking this one. And so what it does is it tells the Quick compiler not to rename that method on the prototype of the Java object. Actually, it does it, does it a little more than that. It creates a bridge method in some circumstances. But um, it basically tell us about not to obfuscate that name so that the JavaScript can call into it. So the way to think about it is it's a contract, right? It's a promise not to rename properties that are on prototype. It allows prototypal dispatch to JavaScript, so we assume, not, unlike JavaScript overlay types where everything's made to a static method, we assume that there's a prototype and that there's a method on it with the name, the same name as the interface that you're invoking, uh, same name of the method on the interface. And it also allows JavaScript to call methods on GWT references without obfuscation. And it's not just for methods. So for example, uh, let's say there's a external JavaScript object that has a property on it, like dot .width. That's not a method, so how would you access that? Well, what you do is you declare the method, uh, but you put an add.js property annotation on it. And so when the GWT compiler, when you, when you actually invoke this method, when the GWT compiler sees the invocation, it goes, I'm not going to make that a method call. I'm just going to make it a property lookup. And it won't put the parenthesis on there. It will just say dot with instead of dot with open close parenthesis. Um, sometimes you need to export statics. And so that means like fields, static methods, and constructors. And so there is a, a new annotation called at JS export and uh, a sort of partner annotation called at JS namespace. And so here I've got a class called foo, and I want basically the person in JavaScript to be able to say, like, my library.foo.bar is equal to 42. So I need a namespace created, like some JavaScript object literal, and then I need, it to have a, I need to have the foo class live on it, and then I need to have the bar field to actually be exposed on it. And so that's what this JS export does. For everywhere it exists, basically, it says that the name of this thing will live on the enclosing uh, context, which is the enclosing class, um, foo, and then the enclosing namespace, which is my library. This allows you to write libraries in JavaScript. Uh, in Java. So let's say you wanted to write a library, compile it down to JavaScript, and offer it to JavaScript programmers where they can source script it in and just call stuff. This is how you do it. However, it doesn't come without a cost, so you have to be careful. Um, because these methods may be called from any arbitrary JavaScript, the GWT compiler cannot know ahead of time whether or not they will be invoked or not, JS export operates just like an entry point to the program, just like your own module load. In other words, as far as the optimizer is concerned, it traces all of the methods that are at JS exported and rescues them from being deleted and their transitive uh, dependencies. And so you don't want to throw these at JS exports all over the place because you can end up like bringing in more code than maybe you want. Uh, although we are investigating having config files, kind of like ProGuard, where you can actually selectively turn things on and off 
because um, you might depend on some third-party library where someone just went crazy JS exporting everything, and now you've just bloated your code tremendously, and so you want to be able to turn those off. Uh, but anyway, this is useful for writing hybrid apps. Like, you know, maybe uh, half your apps are written in Java, exported to JavaScript, and some other guys are a bunch of JavaScript ninjas off in another room, and they want to basically write the rest of the app in JavaScript. You can even do some pretty magical things. We can actually subclass native JavaScript uh, from GWT. So you have a Java class and you want to extend a JavaScript class as your super class. And so for that, what you do is, on this JS type, you put a constructor, a JavaScript constructor, as this uh, prototype attribute. Uh, so it doesn't matter what it is. It has to be some function uh, out there, which is like how that JavaScript object is constructed. And then what happens is though it's an annotation processor that will generate the stub class called uh, the name of that interface underscore prototype. And what you do is you say my, your class extends that stub class. And that basically tells the compiler that when you're actually laying out this class in the export in the, in the uh, final JavaScript, to set your super type or your prototype property to be that thing. And so this allows you to actually to extend JavaScript. Um, so you, there are reasons why you would want to do this. Uh, it's mostly useful for web components, though, where um, you might want to take some fancy button that's written in JavaScript and subclass it in Java, override methods in Java, um, which you can do. So, for example, uh, this super.sub method here, what's it going to call? It doesn't call the stub method. There's an empty stub method in here called some method that's just so the Java compiler is happy. What it really does is it calls the some method in the JavaScript prototype of the of the real superclass. And when you do this, believe it or not, instance of and cache checking work. So for example, if you were to do something like polymer button instance of cell table, you'd get false. Whereas with today's overlay types and JavaScript objects, they all return true for every cache check and for every instance of operation that applies to another uh, um, JSO object. Um, even things like trying to check if like an input element is an instance of a canvas element will, will, will actually fail. Um, so you <coughs> type checking against native JavaScript objects. Um, we're also going to do automatic conversion of Java 8 Lambda to JS functions. So if there's a JavaScript API that takes a single method interface and you pass in a Java Lambda, it's basically going to generate a function uh, that delegates to that Lambda. And so this will allow you to really easily call any JavaScript API that needs a callback. You just pass in a Java 8 Lambda, and it will work. It doesn't actually require a Lambda. You could pass in a Java 7 or Java 6, like a runnable. You know, you just have to make an anonymous center class. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't care that it's specifically a Lambda. It's just Lambda syntax makes it most convenient. Um, and so since once we have all this, what we're going to do is we're going to regenerate Elemental from the ground up 100% to use this and not use overlay types. Um, so basically it'll just be a bunch of interfaces rather than a bunch of interfaces plus a bunch of like JavaScript uh, native methods uh, classes. Um, and it will be able to be kept up to date at all times because it's going to be generated from an annotation processor. So you can re you'll be able to regenerate Elemental during your build process with whatever the newest API is at any time because it will, it will just fetch the W3C specs from the web of the latest browser specs, and it will rebuild on the fly. And so you'll never have to wait for us to push out a new version of something. If there's a new W3C spec out there, um, you can it will either auto-update or you'll be able to add, a, add an annotation uh, to, to a class to instruct the annotation process to go download from another URL, like maybe it's on HTML5 something that'll work instead of W3C. So you can point it to a different URL that has the spec, and you can just extend elemental as you please. Um, but what this should allow you, uh, get us to is absolute efficient, fluid, compact, fast to the metal web programming. Um, and so you'll never again have to basically beg somebody to add a Disney method into the good SDK. <laughs> so what's all this for? Um, because you shouldn't be forced into a false choice. Um, you know, should you develop your next app or someone in your organization develop their next app in GWT versus Angular or JS or Backbone or Query? Well, why be forced to choose? 
Um, I mean, it could be that part of the app is written by somebody in, in Angular, and part of it is written in Dart, or part of it is written in some other technology. Just like in C, it should be really easy for you to call or to link with any other language. Um, the web shouldn't be any different than um, programming native code on you know, Unix, for example. It should just be that you should be able to link with anything that's compiled with any other language. Um, so, access to low-level power when you need it, that's the main thing. Okay. I don't know what, how I'm doing on time, but uh, I think I'm 45 minutes already. Um, Look at all day. <laughs> okay. We're flexible. So, incremental compilation, this is one of the other pain points I mentioned earlier. Really, I should let John talk about this, but um, we want to be able to recompile only the modules that's changed. So if you have a really large application that's broken up into lots of modules and you modify some Java code in one class, it should only recompile the JS for that one module. And later, actually, it should only recompile that one class. Although we're not there yet. We're doing the two modules first. Um, this is going to come to super dev mode first. Um, just because it's easier to do it in super dev mode than it is to integrate with everyone's build tools uh, to make this work. So it requires, you know, some knowledge in the build system about like how to you know know what's changed, what to rebuild. Um, but uh, you should expect that you know even on a large application that a super dev mode recompile should take less than ten seconds. Um, I don't know when John, we can tell, you give me some stats. I generally seen it to be less than three seconds. Is he in the room? Yeah. 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 Three seconds are good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, most individual modules compile in three seconds. Like uh, actually, most in under one second. But it, uh, you have to count the loop time at the end. Yeah. Usually two or three seconds as well. Yeah. So I don't want to overpromise, but uh, three second refresh sounds sounds pretty good for the Veracal workflow. Um, this works today from uh, draft mode, um, um, but we're going to make it. Uh, in Super Demo, we're later going to work it, make it work from draft mode in the command lines. Um, but the op optimized incremental compilation is further away, and Roberto's working on that, and uh, he probably has a roadmap for it that I uh, can't speak to right now. So testing, I don't really have much to say about this because I'm not an expert on it, but um, I think we would want to incrementally compile tests. That's one of the things we should, you know, try to get going uh, forward. Um, in other words, if you're in if you're in your IDE and you, you change a test or you change some code that a test depends on, we should only really recompile the module uh, that changed and the test and just rerun that test. You shouldn't have to recompile the wor world and run the whole suite again. Um, so we should be able to incrementally compile and run tests. Um, uh, we should have a web mode test harness. Maybe Brian has some ideas about that. but like. Um, He's done some before. He's done a couple yeah, of them. Yeah. I, I have some internal to Google previous attempts that I'm now taking to the next step. So, so maybe we'll see where I get to as far as open source and network. Even with dev mode today, like web mode debugging and testing, it's kind of a pain. <clears throat> and we want to have IDE integration with debugging. So you know, it's one thing for your test to run and break. But then you need to debug it. You got a red test. You need to be able to step into it. And so we're going to need uh, better uh, IDE integration. So anyone feeling joyous at any of this information? Um, well, hopefully some of you are excited about this because we need your help, um, especially for implementing Java JRE emulation. I can do. I, it, it scales for me to actually do the changes in the compiler to support the Java 8 language syntax and other semantics. It, you, it doesn't. It doesn't scale for me to impl to implement like hundreds and hundreds of like Java if util, Java X util function, Java X util stream, and the other things that are in Java eight, patching up all the collections classes to support the new stuff like for each methods and things like that. So, um, I I will need a lot of help from the community on that. And it turns out those are the things that are really easy to shard out as well because there's there's not as much. Um, Synchronization. You know, someone, one person could be off, you know, messing around implementing the Java 8 stream stuff. Another person could be like adding like for each to Java 8 collection. And so it's really easy to sort of take off bite-sized pieces of those things. You know, you go look at the Java 8 spec, and you're like, oh, I see, like you know, map reduce is mi missing from, you know, array from list or something. Okay, I'll add that. Um, so that 
at some point, I'm going to produce a, a spreadsheet of all the things that are missing and all the things we need help for. But I would really like it if uh, you know people um, you know would start messing around with Java 8 and you look at some of the things that are missing and uh, get their hands dirty and try to implement some of them. <coughs> so, uh, writing more tests for Java 8 coverage, both JRE and language features, as well as JS interop layer. And so, like, I've got like some piecemeal t uh, test, but if you know, if you start using Java JS interop when we release it, and there are edge cases or things are breaking, um, it would help to not just file a bug, but to actually write a sample test that tests the feature and give that to us instead, and then I can fix it. Um, using super dev mode more. There's some stragglers. There's some people who are, uh, you know, still holding on to an old version of Firefox or an old version of IE or an old version of some other browser. They just don't want to let go, and um, I don't blame them. Sooner or later, it is going to, but it is sooner or later, it is going to to go away. And so, um, you know, try using it a little more. I know it's painful, and you know, debugging is a pain, but we need the feedback, right? We need to know what's wrong. Like there are certain things that, like within Google. The way we use SuperDev mode is different than the way you guys launch SuperDev mode, and so uh, we need to know like what's really painful, what sucks, and so we can figure yeah. out how to fix yeah. it. You know, I think there's some good contributions. One, like, for, like just getting it working on Windows was really good. Yeah, <laughs> we're not even allowed to use Windows. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, go, going with that is the better the better out of the box project setup experience. If you're going overall, that's just super dev mode, right? If you're a new, uh, you know, you're a new Angular programmer, right? You drop in the Angular library, you just start going, right? Um, you're a new Gwit developer, right? Um, what's the process for getting to a hello world, right? Um, I mean, it's not horrendous. So there are archetypes, there are ID wizards, but um, maybe we should look at actually making or making the out-of-the-box experience uh, better. Like maybe pick one of your coworkers as a kitty pig and force them to write a quick sample app and to see how much would they fail or fall over on <laughs> trying to get it set up. Um, setting up projects is, is actually remarkably harder than it should be, even on like established platforms. Like I, I, I was working on an Android project um, a couple weeks ago, and it took me like four hours to get my ID. Up and run, set up and running for my project, and that's with Android Studio, which is like custom crafted to, to actually be an Android development environment. Um, IDE plugins for for Java debugging in Super Dev mode, especially for Eclipse. And so I know there are uh, community members working on this. Uh, I think the reality is is most of the people who care most about this on the Gwit team are probably IntelliJ users. <laughs> so. Um, so um, we got a little bit to say about this. Uh, we actually have a um, GitHub repository for the um, GPE plugin <coughs> that we basically add people on a per uh, name basis right now because the build is not really working and we kind of um, want to, before we open source this, we're going to have a decent open source build and right now this is still depending on the internal build. And if you're interested in doing something in that direction, you should probably talk to Brendan who's already done a good amount of work in that direction. How does GPE and the S debug thing fit together? The, so, the, the, the Eclipse plugin for source mode debugging? So that, that's that's a completely separate thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brendan, but you can probably better speak for yourself. Yeah, so I guess we should probably get together the people that are interested in contributing to the open source. I've contacted Monolo on. Um, we've had some conversation about meeting up here as well. So I've got the launch configuration done for super dev mode, so you can right click on the project and debug like as you do as in the dev mode or web mode or whatnot, so you can run that quickly. But the next step would be to take it a little bit further and actually make a resource, um, like you can pass an argument for a server for hosting the resources quickly. There are several ways to do that, but um, there's definitely more opportunity to improve it. But I think there's a good step there. I've also reached out to Nicolay on the IDEA team. So um, we're... we're Tallying a list, aggregating a list of all the issues that we can get to um, try to help them, can we give them a push or get in and actually help contribute to the uh, IntelliJ plugin as well. So there's some steps there. Because I saw some, there's a pain point with the arguments. It wants the module path or, or the source argument. So it makes super dev mode a little bit tougher to set up for new users. They don't understand which, it wants an absolute path or Anyways, anything there we can get going. 
I think we can help Nikolay get over the hump, or maybe we he can. Um, he's. Anyways, we can talk about that a little bit more on, on the side. Okay. So the um, the last thing is uh, the documentation in the website. Um, it's basically our public face to the world. It's you know if anyone is even you know, sees a link, new Gwit release is released, they're going to go to the GwitProject.org website, and so it's basically the first impression. And so I think um, we still need to take a look at putting a fresh coat of paint on that. I know. Um, Biden has helped us out with that, but I mean, take just take a look. Here are some Web 2.0 websites. Here, this is Angular's website. This is Dart. This is React. This is Bootstrap. This is Ember. They're all very inviting. They they start out with a call to action. They have the three main things that they're going to deliver to you. They typically have a sample code in the actual. Um, you see at the bottom, but literally, like you can immediately see what an app and those things look like from the front page, like what you're going to be writing. Some of them are even interactive. Now, granted, we don't have a REPL with GWT that we can run inside of the, the web page itself. You know, we, maybe we can run super net mode hosted on app engine or something. So crazy. we we kind of we have a presentation about a REPL okay. coming up. Okay, I'll, I'll save that for later. But my general gist is, is like. This is what a Web 2.0 look, website looks like. I kind of feel like our website looks like a Web 1.0 website. Um, and that's not to you know, knock what you've done, Daniel. You took, you took a site that was really like a Web 0.5 website and made it a Web 1.0 website. <laughs> but I think we can, we can relay out the website to make it a little more um, less cluttered. So yeah, actually, Christian first... has done, with his team, has done some work on it. And they actually have a presentation on a fresh oh, paint. Of... Excellent. Yeah. Exactly. You want to see that right now? Yes. Okay, I would so, love to, I would love to see that right now. So that's my pitch, basically. I think the fundamentals are strong. I mean, I think we got good performance. We've got good libraries. We've got good uh, code size. We've got um, uh, you know good stuff coming up with like Java eight and the new JavaScript interop system. Even down the line, we're going to do some good stuff with the compiler. We got incremental compilation um, very soon now. Um, we just need to fix some stuff with the developer workflow. We need better debugging, better IDE integration, um, better round tripping, better testing, and a, a nice coat of paint on the website. And I think if we can do that, um, you know, we can start getting um, more, more people interested in using Gwit again. So that's my pitch. Um, please get involved. And that's not just for the people in the room. That's for anyone who's watching this video. Thank you.